<laughs> and I so you started because... three months ago. So and so did you move in in Turin already? Yeah. So I moved. I moved in late January, and then um, started working here in February, and then moved into my like actual for real apartment in March, and now it's May. All of a sudden, I don't know how that happened. And so, and you have you gone to the chocolate festival? Because I remember that around that time, around March, there is a chocolate festival in oh. in Turin. No, I must have missed it. Oh, that's so sad. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm wrong. So I, I I vaguely remember it was around a little bit before Easter, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, and and there were like chocolate chocolate events across the city. And, there and was... I remember Turin. Turin is the place where you eat chocolate all the time. There is so much good chocolate, yes. yes. And especially around Easter, like they were selling these huge yes, chocolate exactly. Easter eggs everywhere. Um and I hear that they have toys inside of them, even. So you can get like arbitrarily fancy, massive Easter eggs for people. Okay, well, uh, well, you should know that on top of the routinely good chocolates, there is a special chocolate festival. That's maybe maybe it doesn't run every year. Maybe it's once once every ten years or so. I don't know, but uh, I will I will I will certainly look it up because that sounds like a festival right up my alley. Yeah, please investigate. Yeah. That's the only tip I can give you about Turin. The rest, okay, <laughs> you, you know better than I do. <laughs> um, I did go to. They had a, a a version of Carnival um, in a town nearby in Ivrea, where they mm. threw throw oranges at each other. So it's like the like the tomato flinging event somewhere in Spain, but it was with oranges. It's yeah. kind of funny because in Belgium we have the same. We also have like a traditional carnival, and then as a as a kid it was very scary, because indeed you have these people like with the very very weird costumes. Yeah. And throw oranges not to each other but they throw it to the crowd okay and, which can be quite painful actually so uh, yeah I I, mean, I did it once, <laughs> and since then I, I i just avoid it yeah I bring my kids just uh, because it's part of the tradition right to be scared of something <laughs> exactly <laughs> in a controlled environment but still it does make sense to be scared of them like the oranges are huge <laughs> and they will hit you yeah yeah. And I suppose you, you know Tim, right? Probably. Uh, yes. or yeah, very well. Yeah. yeah we, very well. We, we knew each other for, well, the whole time I was doing my PhD. Because so, <laughs> we were both in Northeastern for the five, well, five and a half years I was there. I guess you left a little bit before I did. I left right at the start of Corona, so you would never have known. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was all the same by that point. So. <laughs> You were still on my computer screen somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Barely registered. <laughs> yeah. Will you be going to NetSide this year? Me? Yes. Yeah, nice. The same for us. Well, I guess, Reno, you, you, they're, they're making you go to give a keynote, right? Yeah. Exactly. They're obliged <laughs> me to go now. So actually, I'm, I'm, I'm finalizing booking because I'm going by train. I don't know if I told you there's a night train. Yeah, yeah. You and your son, right? But the website is super complicated, so I will go to the station to buy it because I, I don't understand. <laughs> uh, all sorts of options, and I think that I need some human interactions to properly understand what, I, what I'm what i actually buying. Yeah, <laughs> good choice. <laughs> Figure the options out, yeah. Do you want to share your screen, Carolina? Yeah, let's figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh dear. Um, share screen, desktop two. Nice. Yeah, so we have something. Something. Looks like. Oh, we have a slide. <laughs> Wonderful. And now you have a slide, yes? Looks great. Yep. Okay. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, so we'll give people another like two minutes or so, maybe, and then. Yeah. Could we could also just turn this one around? Yeah. Either way. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, this one's also the microphone, so we can yeah. Yeah.
Did I get the date right? You think I got the date right? <laughs> Looks right. Yeah. I can't see the year, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm blocking blocking my own year. I think I wrote a 2023, so <laughs> still trips me up sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Same. Anything? Should we get started? Yeah. Great. Okay, you good, Carolina? Yeah. Great. And we already started recording, right? So we're yep. all set. Excellent. So thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to the first uh, network seminar of the Trinity term. Uh, this week, we're really glad uh, to have Dr. Carolina Matson here. Uh, Carolina is a dear friend and longtime colleague of mine. We both uh, did our PhDs at the Network Science Institute at Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, after that, Carolina moved on to Leiden University as a postdoc uh, and is now a researcher at Sentai Institute in Turin. And she's going to talk to us today about real world walk processes on networks. So please take it away, Carolina. Awesome. Well, uh, hello, everyone. And thank you all for tuning in to um, hear me talk about this. And super thanks to, to Tim for introducing me so kindly. Indeed, I will talk to today about real world walk processes on networks. Um, what I mean by real world walk processes on networks are things like this, things like uh, payment systems, football or commercial air travel. They are processes where, um, where there, where each it, there are kind of like events. So like each event is a step in the walk process. So here you would have a step would be a transaction in within a payment system, or you would have a pass within a, a football match, or a flight within the kind of system of air travel, and the thing with these, uh, the kind of unifying feature of the events is that each event is, so it's a step in the walk process. It moves something tangible from one node to another. So a transaction moves money from one account to another. A pass moves the football from one player to another. And a flight moves a set of group of passengers from one airport to another. So it's kind of the, the unifying feature of what I'm talking about when I say real world walk processes. Just a quick note that these uh, events, these uh, transactions, passes, flights can be weighted or unweighted. I hope everyone understands what I'm saying when I say a real world walk process. I think it's fairly intuitive, but I do want to delve into what I see as the defining feature also of real world walk processes. And that is that real world walk processes have to maintain their integrity in practice. I mentioned that there's something tangible moving from one node to another. And the thing about tangible things is that things have a tendency to stay where they are placed. They don't suddenly multiply or disappear. Passengers don't vanish. We, when we uh, pay money, it, like two plus two has to equal four. That's the only way it makes sense um, to do bookkeeping within payment systems. But this is actually quite a restrictive constraint. And for that reason, real world walk processes are rarely, if ever really, uh, self-contained. Generally speaking, you'll you'll see that you'll find that there are, um, in addition to like the walk process itself, there are also processes that create and destroy walkers, and these are um, like distinct from the walk process itself, even if they are oftentimes substantively important. So football is maybe kind of an interesting one here where you have you have an entire system of referees right set up to uh, to determine when um, to kind of make make sure that the 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 process stays 
uh, within within the bounds of play. Make sure that the ball stays within um, within the boundaries of play that we've defined. That football has defined as it's that has been defined to be football. Um, perhaps more familiar, also payment systems. If you have if you have a bank account, you have money in that bank, and you can easily pay other people at that bank. But payment systems also have ATMs where you can go and kind of withdraw money, so you can put money in, withdraw money, etc. And I do want to emphasize that maintaining integrity is a big deal. Truly, it is the defining feature of systems involving a real world walk process. Payment processing, uh, for example. So that tends to happen in the background of our lives, but it's not a given that it's gonna work. And these operations truly rely on arithmetic operations like two plus two being four. This is a story from Liberty Bank in New Orleans after uh, Hurricane Katrina, where the CEO made an extraordinary decision. The servers of Liberty Bank were flooded and until Liberty was reconnected to the global banking network, the CEO and his colleagues could have no idea how much money each customer had in his or her account. But imagining his customers camping out in hotels around the country, racking up expenses, the CEO increased the daily maximum ATM withdrawal to $500 and hoped that his customers had the money to cover the withdrawn cash. Some of them didn't. And that decision ended up costing Liberty roughly $1 million in payouts to people who didn't actually have the money to cover their withdrawals. So that was extraordinary for a bank to do. Payment systems are on the hook for any money that they lose track of in this kind of a way. But it's also an extraordinary situation in that these systems usually operate seamlessly and kind of maintain the integrity of uh, of the payment process um, without uh, without problems so much so that we barely notice it. Now, so this is so maintaining the integrity is the defining feature of a real world walk process, and I'm going to try to convince you now that this does come into play whenever we work with records of that process. So let's stick with the context of payment systems for now and go through what this it being a real world walk process means for us in our data. Let's say I'm node B and I don't have any money to start out with. So let's say I babysit for uh, the weekend and maybe I make around $200, great. Then I go buy a used bike for $200. But then after that, I cannot go buy a latte. What were my dollars are now with my bike mechanic and I don't get to use them again. This transaction is disallowed by the payment system itself. My card would be declined or I open my wallet and I have literally zero dollars, right? Um, this transaction can't happen. And so you won't find it in the data. That's okay though, I'm pretty happy with a bike. But the point is that these transactions are bookkeeping records. They are events in a weighted walk process. Uh, this process is, it's not, um, it's not self-contained, it's not infinite, it's bounded. There are deposits and withdrawals that add and remove money from the system. But within the system, within this scope that we're talking about, within our data, bookkeeping imposes a global constraint. And so basic accounting constraint constrains what it is possible for us to see in the data. So let's, without further ado, let's go on to uh, do some analysis analyzing some of these records. And what I'm going to talk about here are two examples of cases where I've analyzed real world walk processes. First, we're going to look at a descriptive analysis of a the circulation within a community currency called Sarafu. And then we're going to put uh, time back in and consider closely passing dynamics in indeed football. So I'll do the, the, the less exciting one first, perhaps. Uh, so we're going to study Studying circulation, this is a paper just out in Scientific Reports, Circulation of a Digital Community Currency by myself and two fabulous co-authors. Specifically, so we're going to consider a payment system called Serafu. 
It is a digital complementary currency run by Grassroots Economics, which is a Kenyan nonprofit foundation. Um, Sarafu started off as kind of several local community currencies that were brought together onto the same digital platform in um, early 2000, uh, 2000, early 2020, obviously. Okay, um, Kenya has, Kenya in general has a well-developed mobile payment infrastructure. So at, at this point, Sarafu was all digital. Your account would be tied to a phone number and you can transfer to Sarafu to someone who accepts it via a USSD menu, kind of somewhat similar to sending an SMS. And when you send someone Sarafu, you would be sending them Sarafu instead of sending them Kenyan shillings. Sarafu is a separate currency. It can't be exchanged. Um, so it's, a, it's parallel, it's completely separate. Uh, although its value is kind of understood to be around one-to-one -one with Kenyan shillings. So that's uh, uh, Sarafu. We are looking at transaction records from Sarafu over 16 months. Um, these have been published by uh, published by the UK data service by uh, the folks at grassroots economics themselves. Uh, the point to uh, get across here is that Sarafu was quite actively used over this period in that um, the communities saw considerable economic disruption due to the COVID-19 pandemic. You can see that the um, amount that people were using Sarafu uh, grew dramatically kind of right at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. And then as things normalized, um, the use of Sarafu also kind of went headed back towards baseline levels. This general pattern is um, consistent with how we understand that community currencies work. Community currencies are known to see spikes in usage levels during periods of economic disruption. So the approach we're gonna be taking here is to consider the full period, both this expansion and the return to baseline. And we're gonna construct a Sarafu flow network and then we're going to remove the uh, kind of system run um, accounts so that we're looking at the circulation among uh, users. And then we're going to consider some research questions that are meaningful, um, not in the technical sense, but that are substantively meaningful relative to this particular application area. So we're going to ask where and among whom is Sarafu circulating and who are the most prominent Sarafu users. These are questions that people running the Sarafu system or people interested in community currencies would uh, find substantively interesting. This is the Sarafu flow network, one of the prettiest networks I've ever gotten to visualize. So the Sarafu system supported uh, just over 400,000 transactions among more than 40,000 regular accounts between January 2020 and June 2021. This resulted in the circulation of almost 300 million Sarafu, which is again visualized here as a network of monetary flow. So this is the time aggregated network of all of the transfers among the ordinary accounts. And because these are records of a real world walk process, we know that this corresponds to flow of Sarafu between these nodes. So nodes are accounts and the edges have a weight that is the observed flow of Sarafu across that link, sum of all transaction amounts between those two accounts. So this is a weighted, directed, time aggregated network representing the total circulation over the observation period. In this particular visualization, the node colors correspond to the reported home location. Um, that'll come back later. Mostly these are uh, uh, these locations correspond to geographic areas, little localities. So we can now ask and look at, okay, where is Sarafu circulating? What we did uh, here was to use a community detection method called uh, InfoMap, and we choose InfoMap because InfoMap is a flow-based method. It identifies uh, modules where kind of a, a walker on this network would tend to remain. Um, but we actually, um, we don't, here in our case, we don't really have to simulate a walk because our data already gives us the real observed flows. I think it's like dash dash raw or something that you put into uh, InfoMap when you're running it and InfoMap will 
um, compute the uh, compute its flow based modules with just the flows that you give it. So in this context, when we're giving it um, when we're giving it edge weights that correspond to real observed flows, InfoMap is going to pull together modules that contain as much um, as much of the transaction volume kind of as possible. This is what it looks like. It looks rather, it works rather well, um, and that it works well because InfoMap is a flow-based method, right? So, the colored here are the top five um, uh, highest level InfoMap modules, and they contain ninety-nine point seven percent of the uh, transaction volume. So, there was not so much transaction volume between these modules. Uh, circulation itself was quite modular. This is true also if we go down um, uh, to subsequent levels of the InfoMap uh, hierarchical clustering, where if we look at the second level modules, the 37 um, modules with more than 100 accounts in them contained uh, a full 96.5% of the transaction volume. So now from these kind of, yeah, uh, flow-based modules, we can compare these to the geography labels that we have and draw the conclusion that circulation is predominantly local. There is a strong correspondence between the module or the submodule and the reported geographic area of most users within that subpopulation. So circulation is geographically constrained, and even, in fact, the areas that are labeled in the data appear to be amalgamations of even smaller localities. We can consider also among whom we have a bit more uh, information about the accounts, not that much, but a bit. In particular, there are 14 categories into which user reported livelihoods were grouped. The most common ones were uh, farming, especially in rural areas, um, uh, labor, especially in urban areas, and also like selling food, which is common in both urban and rural areas. Also things like um, uh, savings accounts, running a shop, um, water, uh, etc. And so what we hear in this figure are the 15 largest uh, sub sub modules. And we see that in all of these populations, the, um, the distribution of livelihoods is quite diverse. So the subpopulations have diverse livelihoods. Um, so we conclude now that circulation was occurring locally among users with diverse livelihoods. And this is true even at the scale of a single village. We can also ask who are the prominent Serafu users? Of course, we're gonna use a network centrality metric, but what's nice is that there are also uh, flow-based network centrality metrics. So in particular, we're gonna use weighted page rank. It is a flow-based method that identifies hubs where walkers, that walkers tend to visit quite often. Now here we are simulating a walk. Page rank is the equivalent of e equilibrium of a random walk process. Um, even when we give it the edge weights that correspond to actual flows. What we can do is draw a parallel between the value of the weighted page rank and the expected account balance if the observed dynamics were to continue indefinitely, plus the kind of randomness that, that page rank throws in. So specifically, um, page rank has its simulated walkers uh, randomly restart and what we do also is to um, is to use real observed inflows to restart the walk process in a way that makes sense in the context of the data. Now, our system is nowhere near equilibrium, but we can look at the empirical account balances that we have at the end of the data. And we find that the correlation with empirical about account balances is at least consistent across a wide range of uh, parameter values, including the magical 0 0.85 that is the default um, for, for page rank since the very start. So we use weighted page rank now as kind of the uh, centrality metric, and then we use a uh, simple regression to see which of the account features um, correlate with higher uh, higher prominence in the network. 
We find that accounts held by community financial institutions are the most strongly associated with uh, weighted, uh, weighted pay drink. These are the uh, savings accounts that are um, highlighted here. It corresponds to kind of group accounts held jointly by a so-called rotating savings group. Uh, there are only around uh, 260 of these in the data, so it's kind of a, a small amount of group of accounts that are very, very important. Um, also, uh, accounts of faith leaders are also have a, a kind of a huge sign, but there's even fewer um, of those. And then if we look at kind of groups that are more numerous, we see that early adopters and women are slightly but consistently associated with higher pay drink. And this also makes sense in this context based off of the kinds of um, uh, on the ground, on the ground analyses um, that have been published elsewhere. So in the bigger picture, I'm not uh, trying to convince you that Sarafu itself is, is super, super important uh, in the like grand global economy or anything like that. But I do want to, but I'm sharing it as a demonstration by example of the kinds of uh, contextually meaningful questions that you can get an answer to by having this nice match between the type of data, flow network, and flow based methods. We end up getting concise answers to domain relevant questions. More generally, Networks of monetary flow are superb representations for circulation within currency systems over a period of time. That's especially true when the transaction records are uh, comprehensive, as is the case for community currencies, cryptocurrencies, perhaps central bank digital currencies. Our approach definitely also can be extended to payment systems that are not themselves full currency systems. So things like uh, in the US it would be Venmo, here it would be Satispay, Sweden it would be Swish. But yeah, um, payment platforms um, within a single bank, intrabank payment systems, also large value payment systems kind of between banks and financial intermediaries. And in some cases now in the last, uh, some countries now in the last uh, five, 10 years have got whole uh, national payment systems up and running. So um, studying circulation is definitely something we can do with network methods uh, quite nicely and concisely. So this is actually a great place if there are any, any and has uh, clarifying questions about the community currency analysis. Otherwise, I will be happy to move on to discussing passing dynamics. All right, seems like I was very clear. Um, any, I'll take questions at the end. Cool, so uh, passing dynamics. Um, here we're now we're gonna look at uh, passing dynamics in football, also from this perspective of a real world walk process. This is now from a paper called Trajectories Through Temporal Networks, um, also with Frank Takis at Leiden University. And the first thing to know here, to kind of orient ourselves into the, the realm of, of sports science analyzing football, is that passing sequences are pretty cool. There are some of the, some kind of uh, classic results within sports science on analyzing um, passing sequences or possessions in football. Uh, here, the Mike Franks and Ian Hughes, they study the 1990 and 1994 kind of hand annotated, hand annotated FIFA World Cups. And they find that 80% of goals are scored from short possessions, meaning less than four completed passes. And that it takes about 10 shots to get one goal. And that um, the longer the possession, the more shots result. And the uh, longer the possession, the more goals per possession. So passing sequences are cool, but aside from this kind of uh, hand annotated stuff that they did, we don't normally have data as passing sequences or possessions. The kind of data that's available about uh, football is more generally what's called match event data. 
This is a, a summary of a public data set of spatiotemporal match events in soccer competitions by Papalardo et al. In, from Scientific Data in 2019. It's data we're going to look at. They have match events from five domestic leagues in Europe, as well as two international tournaments, World Cup in 2008 and the Euro Cup in 2016. Uh, within the um, domestic leagues, there are a few hundred matches per league. There's a few fewer in Germany because there are two fewer teams in the Bundesliga. And there are a few thousand events per match. It's nice that in the data, they do have uh, uh, tags for whether passes are accurate or inaccurate, as well as whenever there's a goal um, that results from an event. So now to get from this match event data back to being able to analyze possessions, we're gonna do what we've been calling trajectory extraction. So here's what the match event data looks like. It's not so complicated and it's ordered by time. So I'm hoping you'll agree that it's pretty straightforward to make a trajectory that corresponds to a possession for this example. You have a free kick, then you have a pass, then you have a touch and then you have a shot, cool, okay. But then what? Let's say the next event is a clearance by the other team. This could be the start to a counteroffensive or whatever. Looking at this in context, it's clear to us that this is now a new uh, possession, that this is now a new trajectory. It's now a new possession. We should split the data here. Um, but we need some kind of way to automatically incorporate or to be able to automate this um, context. The data itself is not going to know like the data, the data itself is not going to know what the rules of, of football are, right? This is something that we are putting on top of uh, the data. So what we did was to consult the rule book and the sports science literature to define systematic bounds for when the passing process starts, ends, and restarts. And so specifically, we kind of break it up, break the data set apart whenever the play is interrupted, meaning it'll, it restarts with a free kick or a throw in or something like that. Or whenever there's a turnover to the opposing team, because we want our possessions to have only uh, only one um, team's players by only one team. So this works, can do that. Uh, codes out there if you're curious. And now that we have this, we can do trajectory-based analysis. First thing we can do is, of course, try to replicate uh, what's going on here. So passing sequences are cool, uh, and we're happy to report that passing sequences are still cool. We uh, confirm, or also 28 years later in the 2008 FIFA World Cup, also around 80% of goals were scored from short possessions, meaning less than four completed passes. It still takes about 10, about 10 shots to get one goal. And we still see that there are more shots per possession if that possession is longer. What we don't see anymore is that um, there are more goals per possession if the possession is longer. That's not necessarily true anymore, or it could be differences in how we look at the data, of course. But mostly this is here just to say, okay, this seems to be working. We are getting possessions that make sense in the context of um, the prior literature. So then we can move on and do something maybe more exciting and look at the kind of passing dynamics that are described now by this data set of, of passing sequences or of um, possessions. So to do this, I'm gonna talk for a moment about Markov order. So where the, the being like, what is the order of the process itself and try to interpret what order means in the context of a passing process, in the context of passing dynamics. So I want you to imagine uh, for zeroth order, what it would look like to have uh, school children um, playing football. Uh, sometimes I think it's called uh, in the Netherlands is at least blob football where like all the little kids run after uh, run after the football. There's like no no not so much structure involved. Some kids might be uh, more into it than others, and so some kids get the ball more often. But really, it doesn't necessarily matter which kid has the ball in terms of which kid gets the ball next. So you can um, represent this process more just like random jumps, um, biased random jumps between the little kids. 
normal football is closer to what we would think would be first order, where there is this kind of underlying structure. You have a goalie would pass to defenders, defenders pass to midfielders, and so on. So this would be then first order, where you where you have a walk process um, going on over a network. It matters who has the ball in terms of who gets the ball next, but like that's it. So this would be a walk, random walk on a network. And then if we go towards second order, it would mean that our dynamics are no, no longer Markovian in that it matters who a player receives the ball from in who they end up passing the ball to. And so now we have suddenly a walk with memory. And um, what's cool for us in doing this work is that there is, uh, is, there is a, a, a paper out there as well, some code called um, a what's it called, a package called PathPy that has a, a function where you, you pass it, uh, you, give, you give the function your, your We did that, we threw this data set into uh, bigger than I ever expected them to be. It turns out that many of the best teams in the most competitive leagues in Europe play with second order passing dynamics. Those that these are the uh, the rankings here and in bold are the teams whose passing dynamics were second order. So in the uh, passing in these uh, football of uh, these teams was predominantly first order. All the national teams um, came out being first order, thankfully none zero with order. Um, and then as well, also 75 of the club teams. There is a group of 23 teams that was playing with second order passing dynamics. And of these 23, 17 ranked in the top five of their league. And this group includes all five of the league winners. Um, it's almost too good to be true. I'm not and still not entirely sure why I'm listing several possible explanations in I think the order of plausibility. Um, it could be that the best teams see less interference from the opposing teams and end up with longer possessions, and that this matters in, in the in the context of the statistics somehow. Um, it could be, and it would be neat if it was, um, that something about second orderness might encapsulate greater creativity in play. That's what my uh, sports scientist friend would would most rather we find. Um, but I'm, yeah, not sure. It theoretically, I suppose, also could be something like ingrained training of multiplayer tactics. From looking at the data, I'm very skeptical of this uh, explanation. I don't think that that's what's going on, but um, suppose it's, it's a plausible explanation as well. Looking again, stepping back out again to the bigger picture. Again, this here is a demonstration by example where focusing on the movement of the ball and formalizing the balance of the passing process let us convert uh, a data set of match events into possessions. We're not sure what's going on with second orderness, but at least it is a kind of contextually meaningful um, thing that we can uh, keep studying. So basically we should be doing uh, more of this. Sometimes it makes sense to study not the network, but the process. On that note, I wanna um, take us into the future a little bit and talk about where we go from here in terms of data, tools, and theory. On the data side, we've talked about trajectory data and event data and how to go from one to the other. These are both cases where the process is what is observable. Trajectory data explicitly incorporates the integrity of the process and the bounds of the process. For event data, this is implicit. And so if we wanna go from event data to trajectory, trajectory data, we have to make the bounds explicit. And so the difference between event data and trajectory data 
It's the difference between manifests and itineraries, clicks and click streams, passes and possessions. But we can also consider that sometimes we do have network data. If we have a road network or we know the scheduled flights, flight routes, um, or we know the physical internet connections, we know the hyperlink network, uh, team formations maybe, or if we know the customer supplier ties in an economic network, then we know where the events of the process are likely to take place. But in order to be able to get some, in order to model the process in some way, we would need to pair this with information at least about origins and destinations, for instance. Um, we need quite a bit more additional data uh, about the process in order to go from network data to uh, some understanding of the real world walk process. There's also uh, path data, which is um, quite interesting as well. Again, here I think it's the transit case is the easiest to wrap our heads around. When you use Google Maps to find a way home, um, the, you, you are making the origin and the destination explicit. Um, but if we're if we're looking at like data of like possible routes between different places, what we're missing if we want to have an understanding of the of the full process is we would be missing ridership along each of these routes. So to go to have data on a real world walk process, you can also have path data and weights or something like that. So data, well, there's. Uh, once we start looking and put it into this type of context, there's quite a bit of data out there on real world walk processes. We definitely can move forward here. Also on the tools, there are there's actually a whole lot of tools out there and in development that we can use to study real world walk processes. Most of these are framed in the, se in the sense that they allow analysis of the network underlying the walk process, um, but they are also in a sense, they give results that correspond to, like, that are about the process. So there's um, tools out there to define central nodes, detect communities, look at these higher order representations to also do um, better notions of, of centrality and, and communities, and also this concept of, a Mar of the Markov order. Um, there's also, uh, a sense in which many of these tools can be used to uh, start to model the process. So if you put a random walk on a network, you would be modeling diffusion, right? So we can start to work towards, all right, how do we put in origins, destinations, those kinds of things to get to the point where we are modeling the walk process, the real world walk process itself. So lots of tools out there for trajectories or observed walks. Uh, also certainly plenty more um, since I made this slide. Please don't think of this as an exhaustive list. And then finally, I think there's a uh, good um, space out there to think about uh, theory in terms of real world walk processes and kind of build up a theory of real world walk processes. Um, uh, I, in doing so, I do think it's important to be a bit humble and consider that the people who devote their lives to studying a particular process, like uh, community currency or or sports sciences, in the con in the sense of of football, they might have some idea of of what's important and what's worth looking into. Um, I'm so I'm definitely not going to embarrass myself by start talking about about uh, some kind of a, a theory of of passing dynamics in in football that is beyond me but i have been working with payment systems and currencies for a bit longer so i'll um, say that there's moving in this direction i think there's some interesting stuff to be done the disciplinary differences are absolutely ginormous, but I do think I've worked out um, some of the uh, math to relate what's called the velocity of money in the context of economics, in the context of monetary economics, to what we would 
considered to be kind of the rate of a real world walk process. So if you're interested in, in how at least I'm trying to develop uh, this theory, then there's an early version of that is out on archive. Um, it's uh, always exciting to talk about these kinds of things, but in terms of, yeah, uh, real world walk processes on networks, I do think that there's exciting directions to go um, in the directions of uh, data, tools, and theory. That's actually uh, it for me. So here's the list of the papers that I've touched on in this presentation in case that is convenient for you. And then I'm very, very happy to uh, take questions. I want to hear what everybody else uh, has to say on this topic. <laughs> Thank you. Great, thanks, Carolina. Um, are there any questions in the room? Yeah, please. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. I was wondering about the payment data. So when you look at financial transactions, people sometimes try to take money laundering. Uh, that might relate to uh, these paths that you might see about passing money between people, between the same group of people in a circular fashion. Can you actually detect that in your data? Um, so depends on depends on how it's happening, right? There are certain patterns. A lot of money laundering happens between payment systems, um, precisely so that it's more difficult to track. And that's not something that um, this particular analysis would be able to look at yet. But if you do have a pattern within one payment system, say um, something's called smurfing, I think where you like from one account spread money out to a bunch of other accounts and then back into another one, that kind of a pattern you would be able to pick up by uh, following money through the system. Um, I have as well um, kind of found that using exploratory network analysis can be a truly excellent way to find um, fraud and kind of people doing weird things, uh, scams and, and stuff uh, within a system. Um, once, you, once you identify a pattern that happens, usually there's easier ways to filter those uh, suspicious transactions out from the data. But at least when I was taking a look at um, a data set from a uh, not a from a, a real uh, mobile money provider or like in actually in in the national currency um it's uh yeah uh, sometimes you just stumble stumble upon fraud without necessarily <laughs> intending to um yeah so it's really interesting that you can detect the unknown patterns as well or some unknown patterns and i guess that whatever you detect it will it will be good for something yeah, uh, hopefully <laughs> you can find, yeah, find strange, strange little things come out in the network. Uh, and if I, if, if I can, if I can add, uh, the, so, so things that I know that for, for money, money, money laundering detection, people have been using temporal motifs, right? Which is definitely related to this kind of pathway data that uh, Carolina, Carolina, Carolina is looking at. And so you need like in some of the solutions that exist to find anomalous patterns in like money transactions, they do that from the perspective of, of temporal motifs, if I'm correct. Yes, um, definitely. You can have, um, if you have a lot of like uh, back and forths or like one to many, many to one, um, quite a few, quite a few temporal motifs have been used, uh, have been used in that way. Yes. Um, I think it makes sense also to look uh, what what you what you get on top of that from do it from looking at it as the as a transaction process is that you can you can think of like the money kind of physically moving around and get also sequential patterns. Um, you have another question? Um, yeah, actually, that, that really relates to my, my second question. That currently you're um, you're sort of ignoring the time component. So you say what follows what, but you don't actually pay attention to the time period between events. 
So in, in football, if you if you pass, probably a long pass might be quite different to many short passes. Yes. So. Yeah. So what is cool? What is cool with these? Um, once you have these trajectories or observed walks, possessions, um, flows of money, whatever you want, you do. There is a delta t on every node, um, and so uh, it's a lot of delta t's. But you would be able to look kind of at something like what is the pace of the game at various points in time? Like what's the time between time between the passes? Is it compressed or is it or is it not? Are people kind of holding on to the ball or are, or are passes happening in rapid success, succession? Those are the kind of things that you can look into um, yeah. once you have these possessions because there is now a delta T at each node. Um, excellent direction for future work, please. <laughs> Someone do it. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, Carly and I kind of have a, a related question um, about the football data in particular, um, which is, so it makes total sense the way that, that you all are doing it now to have the possessions be limited to the same team. Um, but there's some contexts where like things are very messy and there might be really important events in a match that if you limit the analysis in this way, you're you're going to get a very biased view. So like what I have in mind is that uh, there's a mistake in the defense. So uh, the the defender like tries, the defender steals the ball successfully. So it takes possession, the other team has possession, but then they mess up uh, in all in very rapid succession. Now the other team has the, the ball and they score. Uh, so then, yeah, so what you see, what you see in the data, the way that we split them up now would be only the last second when they took the ball and passed it, but actually there was a whole play leading up to that that is probably not irrelevant, right? So the the practical question is like, when you talk to the, the sports science collaborator, is there like a sense that a more fuzzy kind of separation between what counts as like an, uh, an important trajectory like would be useful or would it just be so complicated to try to do that that, that it wouldn't be worth the, the effort? So I think there's um, there's several ways to go about that, right? One is to start playing with what we what we mean by the bounds. Um, what um, the main reason that we're making it very strict here that a possession only need, can only be with one team is that um, otherwise you'd have to start putting in dummy nodes because um, you don't want you don't want the network for one team to include every player they've ever played against, right? So in the sense that you only want like the network that you're the network that is consistent across matches are only includes the nodes of of the same team. So you might be able to include something like dummy nodes for um players, players from the opposing team. But the other thing that you could do is to look at uh, is to have is to explore more interesting features of the possessions, right? Here we were just looking, the, the sports science literature generally just looks looks at the length of the possession, which again is it which is not so great, right? Because a, a, a two a two player possession that starts with starts like in one um, penalty area versus the other penalty area in like the defensive versus aggressive um, penalty area would be very, very different, right? And so you could have something like, you could include kind of like perhaps like what quadrant of the field the possession starts in or whether it's a, whether it starts with, it, whether it starts with a turnover or whether it starts with a um, a free kick. Like there's features of the possessions that you could start looking at yeah yeah i think that that's that's great and it reminds me of another thing that i was thinking about with the the really interesting fact that the the best teams happen to be the ones who who also are playing at the second order or you, you're finding the statistical evidence for second order uh is like yeah if you could do some kind of like 
yeah, features on the, the possessions to see is the second orderness maybe coming from the fact that they're more likely to play back, like they're more likely to use the entire pitch and, and kind of go around, uh, whereas the worst teams are more likely to just like put it forward. So I think so, something that you're describing here, like, yeah, just a little bit more feature engineering, which I imagine would be very complicated because this data has so many features already. Uh, but at the possession level, might be able to tell you kind of what what exactly is happening. Yeah, this is definitely an area that is data rich and quite, I think, theory poor. Um, so, uh, yeah, there really is a ton of data. Um, like, even just this particular data has like uh second seconds and there's like precision down to the seconds right and like it has location location on the pitch that each event takes place but that's just this data set the sports science as a whole has moved on to like motion motion capture of like where every player is on on all fields at the same time like what the players are eating like this just insane um amounts of data going into it and I think it's um, it could be useful, useful and interesting to um, develop the, the the theory part of this a little bit more. <laughs> could you say that again? I did not quite catch that. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. If you if you start if you start regressing everything on everything else, you're gonna get you're gonna get a lot of bizarre stuff. <laughs>